All right, coming in at number 10, we have Space Snakes. Dr. Musgrave is a trustworthy man, or at least his credentials suggest he must be. Not only is he a NASA astronaut, he has six degrees, and he's a doctor and a mathematician. He has made six space flights, and he believes that there is life out there. In 1994, he said, On two of my missions, and I still don't have an answer, I have seen a snake out there. What? It's not just a wee little space snake either. He said that it was six, seven, or eight feet long. He said that the snake followed him around for a long period of time and he tried to communicate with it. Space snakes, honestly. Dr. Musgrave thinks that they must have their own propulsion technique, which honestly is just baffling and is a can of worms or snakes. Coming in at number nine, we have asteroids. Astronaut Chris Hadfield conducted a Reddit AMA and he discussed something that scared him. He said, Sometimes we hear pings as tiny rocks hit our spaceship, and also the creaks and snaps of expanding metal as we go in and out of sunlight. The solar panels are filled with tiny holes from micrometeorites. Honestly, that really terrifies me as a person who's like a bit scared of flying in an aeroplane. This would deeply stress me out. He also said, I watched a large meteorite burn up between me and Australia, and to think of that hypersonic dumb lump of rock randomly hurtling into us instead sent a shiver up my back. Like, I'll say Chris mate, Jesus. Coming into number 8, we have The Formation. Gordon Cooper, the last American to spend time in space alone, has had a couple of very strange experiences in the skies. The first happened when he was a member of the Air Force. He was flying with other pilots in 1951 when he saw, I quote, a vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. I'm sorry, but vast armada, that is terrifying, not just one curious UFO, a whole fleet. On top of that, in 1963, Cooper was shot into space aboard a Mercury capsule to circumnavigate the world. As he was passing Perth, he noticed a fast flying green object that was also picked up by Australian tracking systems. Now, the press were briefed that they were not allowed to talk to him about this. Why? Like, Seriously, why? Coming into number seven, we have the check mark. American astronaut Leroy Chiao was the commander of the International Space Station in 2005. During his time up there, he saw some extremely weird things. He explained his encounter to the Huffington Post by saying, I saw some lights that seemed to be in a line, and it was almost like an upside down check mark. And I saw them fly by, and I thought it was awfully strange. Could this have been the formation that Cooper was talking about? Some skeptics even tried to pass the lights off as far off fishing boat lights from Earth, but to be honest, I'm skeptical of those skeptics. Coming in at number 6, we have Magnificent Desolation. What is it like on the moon? Um, utterly terrifying according to Buzz Aldrin. Buzz, as we know, was the second man on the moon. Yes, televised recordings of the moon can be seen, and yes, we have high res photographs, but truly knowing what it feels like to be up there is something only a handful of people can talk to us about. In a Reddit AMA, Buzz Aldrin describes his experience. Experience. He said, My first words of my impression of being on the surface of the moon that just came to my mind are magnificent desolation. He continued by saying, There is no place on Earth as desolate as what I was viewing in those first few moments on the lunar surface. Beyond me, I could see the moon curving away. No atmosphere, black sky, cold, colder than anyone could experience on Earth when the sun is up. While that sounds totally incredible, it also sounds like the beginnings of a total existential. Your breakdown. Coming into number five, we have the spheres. In 1981, following the Saljut mission, the USSR cosmonaut Major General Vladimir Kolvianok gave a press conference in which he shared some very interesting information. He said that he looked out of a porthole and saw something he simply couldn't explain, something impossible to the laws of physics. He described the object he saw as spherical and elliptical, saying that it exploded into a beautiful golden light. After that, he saw two more spheres and a white smoke sphere cloud. Then then, as they flew through the Terminator, the name for the zone between light and day, he lost sight of them. Honestly, how fascinating and terrifying at the very same time. To me, it's also weird and interesting how Russia appears to be more forthcoming in discussing things that they've seen in space, whereas the United States are keen to keep a lid on it. Why do you think the United States are so heavily guarded on what they'll say about what they've seen in space? Honestly, I don't know. Coming into number four, we have The Knocking. In 2003, Yang Liwai was the first Chinese astronaut to be propelled into space. 
Now I understand the loneliness of space might send you a little bit mad, but he said one night that he heard a strange and continuous knocking. He said, and I quote, someone was knocking on the body of the spaceship just as knocking an iron bucket with a wooden hammer. It neither came from outside nor inside the spaceship. I'm sorry but honestly what? Isn't that some of the creepiest space descriptions that you've ever heard? It seems he wasn't the last to hear it either. Two further astronauts heard the same space knocks when they went up there. What are these? Coming into number three, we have the music. Listening to the transcript of the words said on board Apollo 10 is bone chilling. The spaceship passed by the dark side of the moon, and as it did, the astronauts heard a very weird ethereal music. This is what was said between Eugene Cernan, Thomas Stafford, and John Young. That music sounds out of spacey, doesn't it? Do you hear that whistling sound? Yes. Boy, that sure is weird music. We're gonna have to find out about that. Nobody will believe us. Later, Cernan said, That eerie music is what's bothering me. You know what? I hear it too. Who is going to believe it? Nobody. Shall we tell them about it? I don't know, I think we ought to think about it some. It seems that the Apollo 11 crew heard it too. What was it? We don't really know. Coming into number two, we have heat is rising in the capsule. So this is really sad and really disturbing, so do skip forward if you aren't ready for something truly terrifying. In 1967, Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov did not make it back to Earth alive, something he suspected would happen when he agreed to be the solo pilot of the Soyuz 1. His spacecraft malfunctioned and he was quite aware he was going to die. Some of the last things he said can't be translated into words. He was screaming and crying words of anger. Among the last words that can be deciphered are, the heat is rising in the capsule and you've killed me. Whew, honestly, that makes me so sad. Finally, coming into number one, we have They're Watching Us. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, had something very scary to say when he arrived at the moon in the Apollo 11 mission. It was something he spoke about once, but never spoke about again. In a secret transmission to NASA, according to the retired chief of communication system, Morris Chatelain, the first man on the moon's first words were actually, oh god, you won't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now this wasn't heard by the world as the broadcast was dropped for two minutes. Armstrong never spoke about it again, although a lot of credible sources have confirmed that this is what he said. Number 10, a car crash. Let's start with the drama here. Pretty sure if you say you're an astronaut, people are going to look at you differently in a good way. Man, you've been to space. After all, you are a human being who has seen just how small the world is compared to the wide, wide universe. Many revere James Donald Halsell Jr. after the five space shuttle missions he took before retiring in 2006. But he must have hit the ground hard when he came down to Earth. Halsell was traveling in his car to West Monroe, Louisiana and stopped at a Motel 6. While there, he downed three glasses of wine before heading back on the road, which is a no-no. Therefore, tragedy struck. James crashed into a car killing two of the young passengers in the vehicle who flew from the car when they crashed. He was going extremely fast and reportedly tried to steal a bystander's car when he stopped at the site. James told police that he didn't remember leaving the hotel or how the crash occurred. Though they found no drugs at the scene, police did find 10 empty sleeping pill packages back at the room. NASA declined to comment about the arrest. Very, very sad. Number 9. A love triangle. This one? Oh my god. This next one is pretty rough. We all know what it's like to go through a breakup. It's not fun. It sucks. It doesn't necessarily bring out the best in you. Mother of three and mission flight engineer as well as crew member on the 13 day shuttle mission, Lisa Nowak was a prominent figure in NASA's astronaut team. She was even the inspiration for Natalie Portman in the film Lucy in the Sky before she went all breakup song on her ex. In February 2007, Lisa drove from Houston to Orlando, Florida wearing diapers so she didn't have to stop, to confront the woman who she claims stole her man. She claimed she was going to have a calm conversation, but instead she ended up attacking her. She was in a wig and a trench coat and there was pepper spray, it was a whole ordeal. William O'Fallon and Nowak trained together and began an affair in 2004. Both divorced their partners with Nowak thinking her future was with William. Wrong. William started exclusively dating Air Force Captain Colleen Shipman and he thought Noak took it well when he told her. Instead, she ended up sneaking into his apartment, read their email exchanges and well, 
Flash forward to a 900 mile drive, pepper spray and nightmares Shipman will have for the rest of her life. Initially arrested on the attempted murder charges, they were dropped to less aggressive accusations like attempted burglary and kidnapping. Shipman and Bill are now married, while Noah, after years of counseling, is doing much better, though she refuses to talk about the event for obvious reasons. I hope you're doing better. Number 8, married to his work. NASA ended up wanting so little to do with this guy that they actually fired him. Today, divorce is about as common as breakups in high school. Though some happy news, it looks like the percentage is going down, but in the 60s, getting divorced was a major taboo. NASA's astronauts were about the closest thing to comic book heroes the world had ever seen, and they knew that public opinion was a huge part of their funding. So when an astronaut hero misbehaved, NASA wasn't going to stand for it. Don Esol wasn't exactly a faithful husband, and he rarely visited his son, who was dying of leukemia. He also cheated on his wife multiple times at Cape Canaveral, which was flooded with eager groupies. He gaslighted his wife several times when she asked him to admit it, and when she suggested going to therapy if he thought she was crazy, he replied, but I'll lose my job. Dawn and Harriet at last divorced, and NASA soon followed, firing Dawn as well. Bye Dawn! <laughs> The Elena. Number seven, the astronauts wives club. Hoo 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 hoo, not a fun time. Speaking of astronauts behaving badly, let's talk about the reports of the astronauts wives club. These lovely ladies were used to a measly military pay when suddenly they became celebrities overnight. And given the aforementioned squeaky clean image NASA wanted to protect, any scandal was swept under the rug. According to the Astronauts Wives Club, a true story by Lily Copel. On the outside, they were the ideal Stepford wives, apple pie baking, apron wearing beauties. But out of the 30 astronaut marriages from 1961 to 69, only 7 would stay married. The biggest wedge in the marriage was the time the men spent at Florida's Cape Canaveral, which I previously mentioned, which became off limits playground. Cape Cookies became the name of the women who would magically appear to have their own rockets launched by the men who would touch the stars. To handle the silence and stress, the wives turned to excessive ways to self medicate the nightly gin and tonic with a tranquilizer garnish. Yeah. Pretty rough. Number six, fireflies. Ice particles, they said. Part of the capsule heat shield, they said. Could it have been that John Glenn saw something else instead? Glenn was the first American astronaut to orbit the planet in 1962. He was also one of the good ones. He and his wife Annie were married for 73 years. In fact, when he left to fight in World War II, he told her, and I quote, I'm just going down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. To which she replied, Don't be long. He said that every time he went away to war. She kept a gum wrapper in her purse every time after that. Anyways, grab a tissue, that's super cute, let's continue. Glenn, while flying over Australia, saw strange floating mass like tiny little stars outside the Friendship 7 capsule. When he tapped on the window, they flew off. Mission Control were at first concerned the anomalies were fragments of the heat shield, but that wasn't the case. No, no, it was something else. NASA has since explained the sighting as ice particles, but up until his death in 2016, Glenn never really believed it. His wife Annie finally joined him at Peace passing away due to COVID complications at the age of 100 in May 2020. Number 5. Space Music According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the first song played in space was Jingle Bells on the 16th of December 1965. It was broadcasted during NASA's Gemini GA space flight. Though there have been several musicians played out there in the big space ever since, there remains an artist unknown. Eugene Cernan in the Apollo 10 space capsule reported hearing a strange kind of music during a mission. What he described was a strange musical whistling sound like how you would imagine space music to be like the I can't do it. Just imagine very sci-fi. He reached out to NASA Mission Control to see if they'd heard it too. According to the mission transcripts released in 2008, the sounds were recorded. Of course, alien theories have spread far and wide, but NASA made no comment. Then in the Apollo 11, Michael Collins recorded hearing the same sound while orbiting the moon. This time NASA was prepared. They said it was, and I quote, interference between the LMs and command modules VHS radios, unquote. Sure it was NASA. Sure it was. Number 4. Bright Lights and Beyond It might surprise you to learn that not only do we have a ton of garbage down here on Earth, but a ton of space junk sits just above us. In fact, the estimate for just how much is staggering. Around 128 million pieces, about 6,000 tons of space debris in space. Earth's low orbit carries millions of rocket and spacecraft fragments, along with dead satellites. Each one is flying around 18,000 
thousand miles per hour, so faster than a bullet. Yeah. So the likelihood of astronauts encountering space debris is pretty high, but this one example is pretty staggering. But that doesn't stop this case from being very strange. Brent Jett was in the STS-115 mission in 2006 on his way to help construct the ISS, but then he noticed, and I quote, some kind of reflective structure, unquote, outside the shuttle. According to him, quote, it doesn't look like anything I've ever seen outside of the shuttle. That's for sure, unquote. NASA took control of the camera and there were three bright objects in the sky. When they ordered an inspection of the craft, they saw nothing. Not even a hint. Space junk? Or aliens? NASA has no explanation and they won't talk about it, so what is it? And heading on to our top three, number three, the Gordo UFO. I suppose it's not too hard to guess that Major Gordo Cooper was a lover of all things space, but it turns out that his adoration goes deeper than that. In 1957, 30 year old Cooper was test pilot and project manager of the fighter section of the Experimental Flight Test Engineering Division at Edwards AFB in California. Two members of his crew one morning mentioned to him that they caught sight of a strange saucer like object. It apparently didn't make a sound as it landed and took off. The two men took photos of the craft and Cooper was ordered to have the film developed, have no prints made, and send it right away to the Pentagon. He was also instructed not to look, but like of course he did. He saw exactly what the two men described and to his very deathbed insisted the government was covering it up. But not only that, on his 1963 solo trip, he had a close encounter that was broadcasted on NBC. He saw a glowing green object approaching and it was picked up on radar. But when he got to Earth, he wasn't allowed to talk about it. Number two, edits in space. Could NASA be editing the footage sent down from the International Space Station? This theory is hot among conspirators. The idea really started to gain traction in July 2016. Two different cameras, 25 hours apart, spotted a distinct square shape, larger than the Earth. Initially, UFO hunters concluded that it had to be some kind of unidentified object in our orbit, but another theory surfaced that the shapes were actually attempts by NASA to edit something else. Out. Could it be meteors or a cover up of something NASA has determined we are not ready to see yet? NASA was forced to deny that they didn't attempt a cover up, but UFO hunters will never rest until the truth is revealed, even if it has been already, so we don't really know what's true. And last but not least, the Reich and NASA. Well, this is a surprising little tidbit, but honestly, I'm not too surprised. This is definitely worthy of being number one, especially since NASA doesn't advertise it really at all. During World War II, the US recruited the help of over 1600 German Yahtzee scientists. Yes, I said Yahtzee because apparently YouTube gets scared they are death eaters. Anyways, they hired over 1600 German Yahtzee scientists in institutes like NASA to increase their payroll. The code name for this operation was Operation Paperclip because of all the paperclips on the immigration files, which brought in Werner von Braun and his V2 rocket team. The former SS officer would become a US citizen and was a key architect in the Apollo program. What? In 1977, he was awarded the National Medal of Science despite having previously handpicked slave laborers in Buchenwald for his rocket building efforts. Yeah, so. That's special. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the fireflies. In February 1962, John Glenn noticed something strange outside the window while aboard the Friendship 7 spacecraft. He noticed strange glowing particles floating in space nearby that looked like fireflies. He radioed down to mission control saying, this is Friendship 7. I'll try to describe what I'm in here. I'm in a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're round a little, they're coming by the capsule and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. They swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window and they're all brilliantly lighted. They probably average maybe 7 or 8 feet apart, but I can see them all down below me also. John then went on to say that they were moving very slowly and almost seemed to be matching his current speed. After a thorough investigation, NASA scientists deduced that the lights were probably frost flakes that were being lit up as they fell away from the craft. They admitted that that does kind of make them look like fireflies. Of course, there are still people out there online that insist this may have been a first contact with some sort of glowing space books. Next up at number 9 now we have The Glass Dome. Richard Hoagland is an author who wrote a conspiracy theory book about the Apollo missions called Dark Mission. Now, In it, he claims that ancient builders constructed enormous domes enclosing huge areas of the moon's surface. They would have had water and air inside them at one point. He claims there are actually hidden lunar cities that appear blurred and distorted because they are being viewed through this glass. Of course, the next question 
question is, where is he getting all this from? Well, he points out that Apollo 12 astronaut Alan Bean said that on that mission, space seen from the lunar surface was black but shiny as if it was being viewed through glass. Of course, Hoagland used this as proof of his glass dome theory, saying space should be velvet black, it should be inky black, it should be infinity, unending, deep, endless black, it shouldn't be shiny. This is something that Alan Bean has denied and does not claim himself, but the story has gained traction among some conspiracy theory groups. Moving on to number 8 now, we have Musa Manarov. That's the name of this former cosmonaut who is known for spending 541 consecutive days in space. It's safe to say he was an experienced cosmonaut who received numerous awards and honours. In all those years, he never reported anything too out of the ordinary, except for one time in 1991. That year, Manarov was on a mission to the Mir space station and was filming a visiting space capsule dock nearby. He filmed its approach. As he filmed its approach, he saw an object that looked like it was coming off the spacecraft. Here's some of that footage so you can see for yourself. And this by Ma uh, Musa Manarov is uh, the best known one from Russia, I believe. Okay, I think we can immediately, uh, being out in space here, dismiss the possibility that this is, yeah, uh, it is, space is a rock. Now, whatever that was, it freaked him out and he became convinced he had seen something unusual. He said he knew there was nothing that could come loose at that point during the docking procedure. As he continued to watch the object, it floated downwards and away from the capsule. When this footage began to be shared around the world, some people claimed it was nothing more than space junk, but Manarov said he knows what he saw up there and it was definitely not space junk. Next up at number 7 now guys, we have the dots. In March 2017, UFO hunters claim they had found proof of aliens in NASA's own footage. The video in question shows astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti demonstrating how to operate window shutters on the ISS. Now as she talks to the camera in the video, we see several white objects coming into view. The UFO community quickly jumped on this and referred to it as the smoking gun. There was no denying a big alien cover up now. Of course, there's always two sides to the story though. Scott Brando is a man who forensically examines alleged UFO pictures and videos. He gave this video the same treatment and concluded that the lights were either lens reflections or ice particles. Not quite as exciting, but maybe that's the truth. Moving on to number 6 now, we have the organic being. In August 2018, former NASA astronaut Leland Melvin tweeted out that he saw something curved and organic looking floating outside of his craft while aboard the space shuttle Atlantis. Naturally, the first thing he did was tell NASA about it, but they said what he was seeing was not extraterrestrial, but just a piece of ice. Now, When he shared this story on Twitter, the Twitter account for UFO sightings daily asked him if he thought that NASA was lying about that. They believe that his opinion of something looking organic is much more reliable than the opinion of someone on the ground over 400 miles away. Melvin replied that he didn't think so, but you never know. Now, some people even thought that Melvin might have made the whole thing up just to, I don't know, entertain people. All of this has left many questions about his story, ice or organic being, only Melvin really knows. Moving on to number 5 now, we have The Wolves. This is an incredible story, honestly. It's a terrifying account from Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov. Now, in 1965, he famously performed the first spacewalk ever. It was a success, but it was very nearly a disaster. During the war, he experienced both air leaks in his suit and material unexpectedly stiffening. This meant he was almost unable to cram himself back inside the capsule. He actually had to lower his own suit pressure and risk getting the bends when he was inside. If that wasn't bad enough, his craft went off course during re-entry and landed in the Ural Mountains, where he and his commander were forced to wait for rescue as howling wolves began to encircle them. How crazy is that? Next time you guys think you've had a bad day, just spare a thought for Alexei Leonov. Alright, at the number 4 spot now guys, we have the cryptic message. In 2016, NASA astronaut Scott Kelly gave an interview that conspiracy theorists say contain cryptic messages about seeing aliens in space. In the video, he talked about his 340 days on the International Space Station, and then people say he slipped up and mentioned a cover up by NASA and the US government. Kelly was asked about his body's response to being in space for so long. 
He said, and I quote, adjusting to space is easier than adjusting to Earth for me. I don't think I ever felt completely normal up there. I think coming back to gravity is harder than leaving gravity, so maybe the aliens got it a lot easier than we do. It was that mentioning of the word alien that sent alarm bells ringing among the conspiracy theorists. He also spoke about a virtual reality game that the astronauts play on the space station, which simulated an alien attack on the space station. Once again, conspiracy theorists were asking why would NASA make such a violent game, especially one with such a terrifying scenario. Once again, this is one of those stories where it's NASA's word against people who just don't seem to trust NASA. What do you guys think though? Moving on to number three now, we have the flashing lights. This is a very famous set of stories if you're familiar with the moon landings. During the Apollo missions that took astronauts to the moon for the first time, several astronauts reported seeing strange flashing lights. They claimed that these lights flashed in their eyeballs even when their eyes were closed. On one mission, astronaut Charles Duke wore a helmet, closed his eyes, and he still described the light flashes he was seeing to his team. He said they were clusters of white streaks. They happened at the exact same moment that his helmet recorded cosmic rays passing through his helmet and his head. Coincidence? Well, apparently not. NASA confirmed that the astronauts were actually seeing cosmic rays, something we don't see here on Earth because they're all absorbed by our atmosphere. They're so powerful that you can even see them in space with your eyes closed. That's pretty mental. Moving on to the number two spot now, we have the floater. On the morning of August 19th, 2013, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy noticed something floating outside of the International Space Station. Here's a little clip so you can see for yourself. Uh, Chris Cassidy had noted an object that was uh, floating past the station near the uh, station Progress 52 cargo ship. Cassidy noticed this near the Progress cargo vehicle. He called down to Mission Control Houston and took some video of it. Now at first, NASA was just as confused as he was. Was this a UFO? It certainly fit the literal description of an unidentified flying object. After a lot of speculation, NASA said it was an antenna cover from Russia's Zvezda service module. However, many people remain totally unconvinced. They believe that the object is something extraterrestrial, not something of human origin, and that NASA has made up this cover story to avoid public alarm. Personally, as you might know by now, I believe NASA, but what do you guys think? And finally, number one now, we have the saucer. This story comes from Donald Slayton, an astronaut during the Mercury missions. He revealed in an interview that he saw UFOs in 1951. He said, I was testing a P-51 fighter in Minneapolis when I spotted this object. I was at about 10,000 feet on a nice, bright, sunny afternoon. I thought the object was a kite, then I realized that no kite is gonna fly that high. As I got closer, it looked like a weather balloon, gray, and about three feet in diameter, but as soon as I got behind the darn thing, it didn't look like a balloon anymore. It looked like a saucer, a disc. About the same time, I realized that it was suddenly going away from me, and there I was, running at about 300 miles per hour. I tracked it for a little way, and then all of a sudden, the damn thing just took off. It pulled about a 45 degree climbing turn and accelerated and just flat disappeared. An interesting story, and it's of particular interest to UFO enthusiasts because neither Slayton or NASA has provided a rational explanation for this very speedy saucer. And number 10, we have green and shiny. Gordon Cooper was doing one of the most amazing things a human being has ever done. He was completing a 34 hour orbiting flight around the planet. This was in May of 1963. I can only imagine he saw parts of Earth that most people only dream of. But during this flight, he didn't just get an amazing view and some awesome pictures for Instagram. Also, that is the future of space travel. Influencers are gonna go up there and take a bunch of pictures in zero gravity and then space is gonna become a fad for all of the people who want to post it all over their social media. But anyways, during this flight, Gordon Cooper was approached by a green orbiting light that floated up to him in his spacecraft and then flew away. He was so amazed by this encounter that he talked in front of the UN and he said that I believe that extraterrestrial vehicles and crews are visiting our planet from other planets. Hey, this guy has been to space. If anyone knows, it's this guy. 
At number nine, we have Incorrect. Do you guys know Chris Hadfield? You probably should, baby. He's got a master class. If you do it, they let you go to space. But here's one occasion where Chris was relaying information to the Russian Mir space station so they could dock on his ship. While this was happening, his sensors that tell him how far the station is started giving him the wrong information. This is terrifying to see because if they come in too slow, they won't latch and then they'll just be both floating out there in the void of space. And if they come in too fast and they crash and everyone one dies. One sensor was telling Chris that they were 32 feet away and another one was saying that they were 20 feet away. He thought that at least one of them had to be right so he used his thumb to judge the distance and a stopwatch to judge the speed and then realized that they needed a touch more speed and got the connection perfectly. Now this is all very dirty stuff but that is one of the most bad boss thug life things I have ever heard of in my life. The station weighs 250,000 pounds and the connection they have to hit is the size of a DVD player and he eyeballed it. Well now I gotta take his master class. At number eight we have Leroy's Lights. Leroy Chow is a former commander of the International Space Station which is one of the coolest titles I have ever heard in my life. While he was working up there he witnessed something very strange. He saw a line of lights floating through the sky like it was some sort of formation. He said it looked like a grouping of UFOs flying in formation. He also said that it would be ridiculous to think that we are alone in the universe. And if he says that, it's gotta mean something, right? At number seven, something fell off. In 1991, Musa Manarov was on the Russian space station. He was watching a nearby shuttle do a very standard docking, and he decided it would be a good thing to get on camera. I mean, why not? How often are you up in space? Might as well take a few pictures to savor the moment. Now, what he did not expect to see was a little item fall off the spacecraft. Now a lot of you are probably thinking it was just a piece of the ship detaching or something, but the shuttle was already latched. There wasn't any movement that should have jostled something loose from the spacecraft, and then this mystery item fell directly from the ship down towards Earth. It didn't float in space. And it's all on camera, so you can check it out for yourself. At number six, we have Vlad and the Little Finger. In 1981, Vladimir Kolvanyuk was on board the Russian space station and he took a peek out of one of the windows. He saw something strange. He said it wasn't really a UFO, but just a little small object. Even if it's just a little finger sized device because it's supposed to be space, there's nothing out there. Well, he watched this thing for a moment and then it exploded. Maybe it was shy, I don't know. But it seemed that it wasn't some piece of debris or rock or something. There was something in it that made it explode. Maybe it was a UFO. UFO, just a very tiny one, or maybe it was some sort of surveillance device and exploded upon its own discovery. Whatever it was, it's gone forever now. And number five, we have, was it just a reflection or something real? James McDewitt was in space in 1964 and he saw something that he couldn't explain. There was something floating out in space. He said it looked like a ship, but it was in the shape of a beer can and it was glowing white. Now, when you hear something like this, you think aliens. And that's what all the press thought too when they heard this story and they ran it. Years later, he reviewed some of the footage and he said what he saw was just a reflection. Now what do you think? Could this have actually been something out in space and the government told him to keep his mouth shut or was it just a reflection? And number four we have toxic ammonia. Okay this list is teaching me that astronauts are some of the coolest people around. Bob Kerman was on the International Space Station installing a bunch of upgrades. You gotta keep that station looking good. Now while he was out in space doing this a valve blew and sprayed ammonia all over his spacesuit and this is very bad because because if he brought it back into the station, everyone would suffocate and die from the ammonia fumes. So he used his big brain. He floated out in front of direct sunlight because ammonia has a very low boiling point. This would burn the ammonia off of his suit. Another astronaut came out and then brushed his suit off and everyone wore mass breathing oxygen upon his re-entry just to be safe. Now look at the big brain on Brad. I mean, Bob. I meant to say Bob. Bob. And number three, what is that? noise seen or heard. They're two sides of the same coin. One being a little scarier than the other, but just reading this story really freaked me out, so I had to throw it on this list. This was back in 2003. China would launch Yang Li Wei into space. Now, it wasn't just the trip of him being blasted in a rocket into the vacuum of space that was scary. Although the sounds of a roaring rocket ripping through the sky must be pretty terrifying. It was what happened after Yang got aboard the space station. That night he was there and he heard something very strange. There was a knocking coming from outside 
outside the space station. Now this is messed up for a lot of reasons. First, it's the vacuum of space. There shouldn't be anything floating around outside in space. And if there was, it shouldn't be alive long enough to knock. And the second reason, being even spookier than the first, it's the vacuum of space. It's the same reason as the first. Sound needs something to pass through so you can hear it, like air or water. As the old saying goes, in space, no one can hear you scream. So how could this have happened? Could this have just been something in the station that was making a weird noise? Maybe something was floating around loose and bumped against a wall? I don't know, but he heard it more than once. And number two, we have the space eel. This sounds like the title of a cheesy horror movie that was made in the 1950s. We're gonna take two things we don't understand and put them together and then you got a movie. Well, it's actually what Story Musgrave saw. He was an astronaut working with NASA and one day while floating around through the endless void, he saw something very strange. It was a long white space eel. He said it had its own propulsion system to move through space. That sort of discredits anyone who thinks it was just some sort of inanimate object. And that kind of thing does happen. Things fall off of spaceships and space stations and they will just be debris out in the open just loose and going. And if the propulsion system wasn't enough to convince you, he said he saw this thing not once, but twice. And for the number one spot, we have the moon landing visitors. I don't care what you think about the moon landing. If you believe in it, cool. If not, cool. Leave me alone in the comment sections. I don't care. But for the believers, when Neil Armstrong and his crew landed on the moon, there was a lost transmission that Neil sent out when he stepped foot onto the moon. And it went like this. These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh my god. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. End quote. Apparently, there were two massive spaceships that were floating above them as they stepped out onto the moon. Now, this transmission was never released into the public until years later, and Neil didn't talk about it until right before he died. So if you don't believe in the moon landing, I guess this is a cover-up on a cover-up. Starting off number 10 now, we have The Knocking. In 2003, Yang Liwei became the first Chinese person in space. It was a historic occasion, but it also became famous for a creepy occurrence. In 2016, Yang told an interviewer that he heard someone knocking on the outside of the spaceship on that trip. He was terrified and tried to peek out of the porthole but couldn't see anything outside. When he got back to Earth, Yang described the sound to experts. He even tried to recreate it for them, but nobody could identify it. In the years since, many people have tried to explain this strange phenomenon. Some say it could have been some space debris, but others say that this is unlikely. A space debris is few and far between. Others claim it could be the the expanding and contracting of the ship due to the changing temperature of the spaceship as it orbited the Earth. Even though that's the leading theory, many people have their own theories about aliens or time travelers being responsible for the mysterious knocking sound. Moving on to number nine now, we have alien music. In 1969, American astronauts Tom Stafford, Gene Kernan, and John Young went to the far side of the moon for the Apollo 10 mission. It was going to be the final test before Apollo 11 took three humans to walk on the surface of the moon for the first time. When the Apollo 10 astronauts were orbiting around the far side of the moon, they took photographs of its surface. As they were working away, they began to hear music. Specifically, they heard a strange whistling sound that lasted nearly an hour. When it faded away, Commander Kernan said, boy, that sure is weird music. We're going to have to find out about that. Pilot Young replied, nobody would believe us. And for the most part, they were right. Many people couldn't explain the sound that they claimed to have heard, and so they just didn't believe it. The leading theory is that the sound came from radio interference between spacecrafts. Some people have dismissed that though, and have insisted that the astronauts would have known the difference between radio interference and their spacey music. Coming in at number eight now, we have Snakes in Space. In 1994, Dr. Story Musgrave did an interview where he described his career as an astronaut, and one particular time which shook him to that day. He said, on two of my missions, I still don't have an answer. I have seen a snake out there, six, seven, eight feet long. It is rubbery because it has internal waves in it. 
there and it follows you for a rather long period of time. The more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there and that sort of thing brings to you really a certainty that other living creatures are out there. Now usually an account like this might be dismissed but Musgrave is a doctor, he has six academic degrees, is a trained mathematician, he was in the Marine Corps and was a NASA astronaut. He seems like a credible witness. He believes that there are advanced creatures existing in space itself and that he has even tried to communicate with them in the hopes that they come down and get him. Whatever that means. Next up at number 7 now we have docking. In 1995 famous Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield had his first space flight. His job was to relay the speed and range information to the pilot as they were docking into the Russian Mir space station. Any mistakes could have resulted in a total disaster. Too soft and they would have just bounced off. Too hard and they would have broken the space station in half, killing the three people on board. Everything was going smoothly but then one of the sensors started telling them they were 32 feet away, the other said 20 feet away, which was correct. If they didn't solve the problem in 30 seconds, it was over for them. Hadfield had to calculate how far they were away in his head, timing it with his stopwatch to decide when they should fire their thrusters. Luckily, they ended up being spot on and they docked almost perfectly. It took a few minutes before the astronauts began to realize they had done it. They were alive, they had avoided a space disaster, and they had lived to tell the tale. Moving on now to number 6 we have Impossible. On May 5th 1981 Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Kovalyanok looked out of his portal of the Salyut orbital space station. He then saw something which seemed inexplicable to him. When he returned to earth he told the world at a conference what he had seen. He said, many cosmonauts have seen phenomena which are far beyond the experiences of earth men. For 10 years I have never spoke on such things. The encounter you asked me about happened on May 5th 1981 at about 6pm during the Salyut mission. At that time we were over the area of South Africa moving towards the area of the Indian Ocean. I just made some gymnastic exercises when I saw in front of me through a porthole an object which I could not explain. I saw this object and then something happened that I could not explain, something impossible according to the laws of physics. The object had this shape, elliptical, and it flew with us. From a frontal view it looked like it would rotate in flight direction. It only flew straight but but then a kind of explosion happened, very beautiful to watch, of golden light. That was the first part. Then, one or two seconds later, a second explosion followed somewhere else and two spheres appeared, golden and very beautiful. After this explosion, I just saw white smoke, then a cloud-like sphere. Before we entered the darkness, we flew through the Terminator, the twilight zone between day and night. We flew eastwards and when we entered the darkness of the Earth's shadow, I could see them no longer. The two spheres never returned. That was the end of the quote. There have rarely been descriptions so vivid and detailed and many people who hear Kovalyanok's story hold it up as proof of extraterrestrial life. Moving on now to number 5 we have Toxic. In the mid 90s Bob Kerbeen took part on his first spacewalk as an astronaut. Unfortunately disaster struck when a connector to a hose began to leak on the outside spraying toxic ammonia all over him. He couldn't get back inside the space station covered in that stuff. He managed to stay calm and he fixed the leak but he was still contaminated. He came up with a plan. Ammonia has a low boiling point and so Bob decided to literally bake himself in the sunlight of space for an extra 30 minutes in order to vaporize the ammonia off him. He had to just sit out there in space hoping that he got all the ammonia off and that he didn't poison the crew and himself when he got back into the station. It was was a success. His plan worked, but it was one of the most surreal and scary moments an astronaut could ever experience. Next up at number 4 now we have the lights. In 2005 astronaut Leroy Chiao was commander on the International Space Station for over 6 months. He was once doing a spacewalk to repair some antennas when something caught his eye. He saw some lights that seemed to be in a line, almost like an upside down check mark. They flew right past him but his fellow astronaut didn't see because they were facing the other way. When he described the sighting to those back on the ground, they dismissed it as a fishing boat hundreds of miles below him. Chiao himself had stated that he doesn't believe there's ever been any tangible evidence that someone else is visiting earth or has done so in the past. He has simply told his story as it is and is leaving all of the explaining up to everyone else. 
Coming in at number three now, we have the drifter. Now for some people, the biggest fear they have about space is that feeling of drifting away from the space station, unable to claw themselves back. Well, Scott Parazinski may have had the closest experience to that. He was performing a spacewalk when a jammed solar panel threatened the safety of the entire space station and the crew inside. After 72 hours, NASA came up with a plan. Scott was told to travel further away from the safety of an airlock than had ever been attempted. He later said in an interview there was a real danger that we could do even worse damage to the space station. Then there was the potential of risk to myself because if there was any metal to metal connection with the solar panel or arcing, I could actually electrocute myself or cause ignition of the 100% oxygen in my spacesuit. The stakes were high, but Scott succeeded. Disaster was averted, but sadly, many of Scott's heroics are still not known by the masses. Moving on to number two now, we have the secret transmission. In 1975, retired Chief of NASA Communication Systems, Maurice Chatelain, published his book, Our Cosmic Ancestors. In it, he made an extraordinary claim about the first manned mission to the moon. He said, only moments before Armstrong stepped down the ladder to set foot on the moon, two UFOs hovered overhead. Edwin Aldrin took several pictures of them. Some of these photographs have been published in the June 1975 issue of Modern People magazine. Now, this claim was linked to the story that there were two minutes of radio silence after after Armstrong set foot on the moon. People claim that the lost audio was of him saying, these babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now, of course, all of this is speculation. An actual recording of that audio or of those pictures has never surfaced. That either means it didn't happen at all or it's been covered up very, very well. Either way, it's a creepy story. And finally, number one now, we have the Green Bolt. Gordon Cooper was a well-known astronaut who flew on the Mercury 9 and Gemini 5 missions. He was the last American to fly alone in space. In 1963, he flew aboard the Mercury capsule for a circumnavigational trip around the world. Everything seemed to be going okay, and then, on his final orbit, as he passed over Perth, Australia, he saw a green object swing towards him at an incredible speed. At first, he thought it was just a figment of his imagination. There have been times where pilots and astronauts have seen objects like this, but their equipment detected nothing. This time was different though. The Moochia tracking station in Western Australia actually picked the object up on their radar. That was huge. Now he had something solid to back up his own experience. He reported the incident to the National Broadcasting Company. When he returned to Earth, he was eager to tell his side of the story, but Gordon claims he was approached by NBC reporters who told him they had been instructed to not question him about the sighting. All of this has only fanned the flames of a UFO conspiracy. In our number 10 spot, we have an alien interaction. Have you ever come across someone that so clearly lied, but they tried to cover it up with a joke? Or perhaps they were so clearly telling the truth and they decided to mask it as it's a joke. Well, that could very well be the case for astronaut Scott Kelly, except I'm not quite sure if he was masking the truth with his words. I'll let you decide. Apparently, Scott Kelly spent quite a lot of time on the International Space Station. He is known as the astronaut that has stayed the longest in the space station. Scott has apparently made a few UFO slash alien jokes in his time that has raised some eyebrows. At one point, he was quoted as saying that, Aliens have it easier in space than we do. First off, that is not a joke. If he thinks that's a joke, I think we need to sign him up for a class at Second City. But second, excuse me sir, but what does that mean? Have you seen aliens in space seemingly live comfortably? Was he told to say that he was joking because he could have revealed a top secret if he elaborated? Possibly. If you're liking this video, don't forget to subscribe for good vibes and more content like this. In our number nine spot, we have UFO footage. Here is some crazy footage that NASA has dismissed. It's so clear that there's something going on here and the complete disregard for crazy footage like this truly makes you feel like, what else are they keeping from us? In 2020, Russian cosmonaut Ivan Wagner made a time-lapse video while orbiting space and he claimed to have found something. Space 
space guests, he called them. In his video, you see the curved edge of the Earth at night with a green swirl of the aura moving across the surface and several falling stars. It's such a cool video to see. Then about nine seconds in, you see a fleet of five possible UFOs. He said that because it's in a time lapse format, you can't measure how long they were there, but it was for about 50 seconds real time. This video is so nuts. I'm so happy that this astronaut decided to share this with the world. At least we know that some of them are on a quest for truth and are not keeping us from seeing crazy evidence. In our number eight spot, we have new planets. Not too long ago, it was released to the public that a possible batch of Earth sized planets were discovered, and apparently, three of them could possibly support human life. Yeah, my mind is blown too. Some scientists are on board with the evidence and some are dismissing it, which makes it confusing to us little guys that don't know what's going on and really just want to know if aliens exist or not. <laughs> Let's be real. We've been kept out of important discoveries before only to have seen evidence years later when they've been declassified. People believe that's what will happen in this case. Perhaps not only were these planets discovered, but possibly aliens. In life as well. These planets have been called the Trappist 1 planets, and the whole discovery just feels fishy to me. As if people are dismissing the evidence to cause confusion so that no one knows what's real and are distracted by the confusion. In our number seven spot, we have the flat earth theory. Many people believe that the spherical earth is a lie and that NASA has been faking the whole thing. They believe that all of the photos of the globe are photoshopped for financial gain. I'm not sure I'm on board with this one, but let's discuss why people think this is a lie. It is believed that it would cost much less to fake a space program than to actually have one, and the funding that NASA gets goes to the people behind the sham. Whoa, imagine. NASA has thousands of employees though, so logically, it would be pretty hard to fake it from that many people. Unless, of course, you had everyone work on projects that are top secret and they aren't allowed to tell their coworkers what they're working on. Like I said, not sure I'm fully on board with NASA lying about this one, but if this lie were proven to be real, there would probably be some kind of civil war, because I bet people would be furious. In our number six spot, we have the gray thing. Here we have another case of is this astronaut a liar or is this a true story? This is a story told by an anonymous online user that claims to be an astronaut who once saw an alien in an underground US base. He claimed to have been traveling through a US base that he didn't want to name as there is only a number of people allowed in and he doesn't want to be tracked. At this base, he saw a person that was gray and he was definitely not from this planet. Obviously. <laughs> when out in space, he had seen a fleet of aircraft that he knew were UFOs, but he didn't think we had any contact with them yet. It wasn't until that moment that he realized that not only do we have contact with them, but also the aliens are actually already living among us. Interesting. While there are so many quote unquote whistleblowers that have mentioned gray people, so this story could be true. Some think it to be a lie, some don't. I think that there are only a handful of people that have gone to space, so it would be easy to find the culprit, and this would be a very risky move on their part. What do you think? In our number five spot, we have UFO in orbit. This story is crazy to me because two astronauts by the name of James Lavelle and Frank Borman once claimed that they had seen a UFO, but NASA dismissed it. NASA claims that the story isn't true and it is clear that they have tried to bury it. They said that what these two men saw were just the booster rocket nearby, but they both said that what they saw was a fleet of UFOs and the booster in sight. It was not the booster according to them. They were UFOs and the booster. Look, personally, I don't see a reason for them to lie, other than maybe if they were hoping for a future book deal. But honestly, just the very fact that they have gone to space would automatically make them cool enough for a book deal, and I'm sure a publishing house would say yes. So I can't think of any reason why they would be motivated to lie. So I believe them. There's so much out there that we don't know yet. We might as well stay open and believe the actual people that went to space when they say that they've seen something. In our number four spot, we have enormous babies. 
There have been many reports from NASA employees of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin seeing aliens when they first arrived on the moon. They have said that this is a lie and that they never ever said anything about big babies, but a lot of people believe differently, as if they wouldn't have been bought off by someone who would want to keep it a secret, am I right? <laughs> A former NASA employee by the name of Otto Binder unnamed radio hams with his own VHF receiving equipment, bypassed NASA's broadcasting and picked up the following being said by Neil in response to NASA asking, what's there Apollo 11? The response, these babies are huge sir, enormous, oh my god, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you there are other spacecraft out there, lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Allegedly, off the record, the two astronauts did admit to many scientists that they indeed saw something. I could get on board and believe that they probably did see something and then proceeded to lie about it, <laughs> but I doubt they would lie out of malicious greed if they did. It would have been probably due to following orders, let's be real. In our number three spot, we have Is the Sun as Big as We Think? <laughs> This is a theory I had never heard about before researching this video. Apparently there are people that believe that NASA astronauts have lied to us in regards to what they know about the sun. Again, such an odd thing to lie about and also, what for? For what purpose? <laughs> Why would they need to lie about this? But anyways, the theory is that the sun is actually much closer and smaller than NASA has told us. A conspiracy theorist said this, quote, clear photographs of the sun used in textbooks are always produced with modern telescopes containing the necessary devices used to view the sun properly. The telescope manufacturers along with the organizations which use the telescopes, those very organizations which propagate the moon hope have an interest in there being a sun and so their evidence cannot be accepted as authentic. Huh. So it's believed that the telescopes have changed the look of the sun due to a financial interest? Yeah, they lost me. <laughs> but who knows, perhaps what we know about the sun is a lie. That would suck, but I don't rule out anything these days. In our number two spot we have moon people. In November of 2021, China thought that they were on the precipice of making one of the world's biggest discoveries. Moon people, actual aliens on the moon. But honestly, they were either lying to themselves and really wanted to believe it, or they are lying to all of us right now. Dun, dun, dun. Basically, the U-2 to moon rover captured a mystery hut on the moon. But basically, it was revealed in January 2022 that this hut was just a crater rim. <laughs> but was it? Was it just a crater rim? Or was it actually aliens, but we the public have been told otherwise? If they really did make a mistake, it's pretty funny to think that they thought a crater rim was actually a hut for aliens. <laughs> In our number one spot, we have the Freemasons. Ever heard the theory that the government has been infiltrated by the elite with their own personal agendas? Well, some people believe that to be in the case of NASA. People believe that the oldest secret society has infiltrated NASA and therefore it is possible that the information may be corrupted and previous slash present astronauts may lie about their experiences in space. Where do people get this idea from? Well, allegedly Buzz Aldrin had connections to the Freemasons and so did Edgar Mitchell of Apollo 14 and Don Izell of Apollo 7, apparently James Irwin as well. Another theorist pointed out that NASA has symbols that are tied into the Freemasons. They pointed out that the United States is represented by the Eagle and so are the Freemasons and the US was the first on the moon. All of this could be a stretch or it could be connected. Whether all of this is a coincidence or not, who knows, but it sure makes you think. Starting off number 10, no life insurance? This first one is definitely out of this world. Neil Armstrong didn't have life insurance along with the entire Apollo 11 team. That sounds absolutely bonkers, especially considering the fact that he was leaving behind family on earth, so if something were to happen, which was very likely, there was nothing left for them. And also like, what? But it was because they were doing something that was more dangerous than anything any human had ever done before that they just couldn't afford the life policy. Taking out a life insurance policy was nearly impossible, but the astronauts had something up their sleeve. While in quarantine, the crew signed hundreds of autographs and gave them to their family and friends. Even though eBay like wasn't a thing yet, they knew that those autographs would be worth a pretty penny considering how 
famous the team was. Thankfully, they didn't really need to, but that didn't stop the autographs from being sold. One even got picked up at an auction recently for 30 grand. Number nine, Gordon Cooper. Gordon Cooper. I think the phrase never meet your heroes really applies here because as we learned in the first part, a lot of early astronauts really let the fame get to their heads. Cooper was happy in his married life so long as he maintained the happiness of his mistress who was also a married woman. Four months before he was chosen to be an astronaut, his wife Trudy had decided that enough was enough. She was tired of his infidelity and decided it was time to leave after 12 years of marriage and put it in the dust. But little did she know, as she walked away, she was taking away his life dream. As we learned in the first list, divorce wasn't a good look. Cooper begged her to come back. Not because he regretted his ways, but more so because his dreams of going to space would be cancelled. So it's like, come back, I don't miss you though. Whether it was to help him or because she got 70 grand from a Life magazine segment, Trudy went back. They stayed married until he retired in 1970 when it no longer mattered if he was married. So hopefully Trudy got out of there. You know what I mean? Number eight, hidden treasure. Speaking of Mr. Cooper though, he did make some interesting discoveries up there in the sky that he kept pretty close to his chest. Cooper was apparently very talented at spotting sunken ships in the ocean from up in space. Gordon flew on the Phase 7 flight in 1963 and spotted several anomalies that had the potential of being... I don't know, gold soaked shipwrecks? When he got home, he put them all on a map, which was a decade long project. He hunted down and coordinated which ships they could be, but didn't tell anyone until decades later. The discoveries came out in 2017 when a treasure hunter, Daryl Miklos, used the maps Cooper made to make a TV show. There were a hundred sites Cooper speculated were shipwrecks, and the first five were correct, and he just kept turning up right. Good for you, Cooper. Good for you. Number seven, what's the buzz? Speaking of buzz, remember to head over to Bumblebee if you want to see more of me doing this because this is what we do over there too, but quirkier. Anyways, enough of that. The buzz we are talking about is Buzz Aldrin. Now Buzz did some pretty incredible things, but the side of Aldrin NASA doesn't love talking about is, well, yes. Yes, 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 the married life. Apparently Buzz wasn't really an emotional guy, so to help his wife cope, he gave her a pet monkey in 1966. They had one before who had recently died, but this one was like nothing like the docile thing they had before. It hated his wife. It would make fun of his wife, bare its teeth, like use profane finger language. It was very strange. Eventually, his wife got so upset that she said to her husband, it's either the monkey or me, someone's leaving. To which Buzz replied, dryly, what are you waiting for? Ouch. She stayed and put up with the monkey and the primate until 1974. After Buzz came back from space, he took up drinking and had many affairs, so they eventually divorced. Number six, toilet trouble. Toilet humor can be a little taboo of a comedy topic sometimes, despite the fact that farts will always be funny. But you know a stand-up comedian is like digging for comedy and like just trying to get a laugh if they're using toilet humor, you know what I mean? Anyone agree with that? But I'm not surprised they don't talk about it that often. I mean, it's not pleasant to imagine anyone doing the number two, but it's even more so whilst in space, because how does that work? In space, gravity likes to be a little finicky because there, well, there isn't any. From taping bags to astronauts' butts to vacuums, right? Helping an astronaut do their duty proved more difficult than they imagined. They made pants astronauts could wear, which could hold up to 3.75 cups of urine. Huh? and even a 50 grand toilet you had to be strapped into. NASA's Scott Weinstein had to teach the crew to use it and said that it was all about alignment. The hole was a quarter the size of the one that we have in our toilets and some of them had to use an under the seat camera so they could like get perfect aim every single time. Today it's less complicated. They sit on a tiny hole and a vacuum sucks the stuff away. Who would have thought a basic human action would be so hard in space? Number five, money, money, money? Take a guess. Right now, watching this video, how much do you think an astronaut gets paid to venture where no human has gone before? Yeah, like take a minute, I'll wait. Long enough, my first guess was like at least, at least like 700 grand or like millions because you're literally risking your life 
where no one can save you. Even though most astronauts don't actually end up going to space, but at least the ones that do, right? But the actual number may surprise you. Astronauts are paid by the federal government's general schedule pay scale, and they usually qualify for GS 13 slash 14, the highest being 15. This means that they can make anywhere between 100 grand to 161 grand. Hey, to someone like me that's got like two to three jobs minimum to pay rent, that sounds pretty good. But somehow that doesn't seem quite enough for what they do, or does it? Anyways, by comparison, fish and wildlife administrators are reportedly paid the same. So I don't know, how do we feel? I guess the main perk is being able to say you made it to space unless you're doing most of the work on the ground. Thoughts? Number four, the Challenger. The Challenger was one of the most devastating moments in aerospace history. It was literally the worst case scenario that astronauts probably have nightmares about. On January 28th, the world watched in horror as 73 seconds into the launch of the Challenger, it exploded in mid-air, taking with them seven astronauts, including Christy McAuliffe, the first civilian in space. The reason for the explosion was because of the two rubber O-rings, which were designed to seal the sections of the rocket booster, failed. On the morning of the launch, temperatures were unusually low, which put the craft at risk. Engineers warned against launching. Due to media hype and the pressure, they pressed forward, which was the deadliest mistake they could make. NASA tried to ease the public by saying the crew was probably unconscious when it happened, but more research revealed that they were awake and aware. So. Needless to say, not something astronauts love talking about. Number three, Thad Roberts. This next one isn't entirely PG, so like there's a warning for you. But Thad Roberts decided one day that the Mile High Club just wasn't cool enough for him. Thad Roberts always wanted to be the first man on Mars, but he ruined his chances of that for life. I don't know why. Thad stole $20 million worth of lunar rock so he could touch the stars. He, along with accomplices Tiffany Fowler and Shay Sorg, used their official IDs to break in and steal the safe the rocks were in. They took it to a motel, broke it open with a chainsaw, and then scattered them on the bed. Tiffany and Thad then joined the 384,000 kilometer club before trying to sell them to an interested buyer. However, their love making contaminated the rock samples which made them useless to the scientific community. They were eventually caught by the FBI and Roberts was sentenced to 8 years in prison. Also, he could say he had sex that was out of this world. Next up. Number two, questionable water. This next one isn't technically a secret, but it's definitely something that's a little embarrassing to talk about. We've talked about some crazy survival stories on Bumblebee channel, and one of them included drinking urine to survive. Something a lot of survivalists don't recommend unless absolutely desperate. Essentially, if you consume your own urine, you are consuming the toxin your body tried to get rid of. But NASA has found a pretty neat way to make it fashion. Astronauts in space actually drink their own urine, but that's after the ship has transformed it back into water. They've been drinking their recycled urine since 2009 aboard the ISS, so I guess anytime they are thirsty, they just go to the washroom. The toilet they use, as mentioned above, uses powerful acids to help control fungal and biological growth. They don't recommend doing this without this technology, obviously, just in case that idea popped into your head. Currently though, they are looking at tech that might be able to pull water from the air, but they are still far from that. And last but not least, the Apollo 11 hoax. The moon landing hoax is still alive and well, and true or untrue, astronauts aren't likely to be heard talking about it, because it lives in the realm of conspiracy. We have probably talked about it on this channel. If you can find one video about it, post it below. On July 20th, 1969, the first astronauts landed on the moon. It was a race between the US and the Soviet Union to put their flag on some moon cheese, and we beat them. They beat them. I'm Canadian. Right? Forgot. But ever since conspiracy after conspiracy has sprung, 5% of Americans reportedly still believe that the moon landing was faked. About 16 million people. You would think that NASA would just like put this conspiracy to bed, but the video that showed the landing apparently um, disappeared. So that's convenient. Mm -hmm.